you very much. Thank you, that's a very warm welcome. How are you all doing? Everyone all right? Everyone having a nice day? Yeah? Enjoying your Sunday? Very good. Thank you for coming. Thank you for turning out. Hello. Hello. Um, brilliant. Well, I suppose let's get to some questions and see what you all want to know. Hello. Um, so if you were really in Hogwarts, what would be your favourite subject and why? If I was really in Hogwarts, what would be my favourite subject? That's difficult. Probably, I mean, the, the subject that just looks like it's the most fun is Defence Against the Dark Arts, isn't it? I mean, you get to sort of, that is the most exciting subject. Um, one that always sounds really boring is History of Magic. Which I find strange, because I really like history, and I was like history at school, and I'm still very interested in history, so I feel like maybe that would be better than it seems. I don't know why it is, because who's the, is it, is he called, gosh, if I remember this, I, I, I want serious appreciation, please, because my memory is awful. Is it Professor Bins? Let me tell you, that is out of the depths of my mind. That is, I mean, I probably haven't thought of the name Professor. Because did anyone, I mean, I'm literally, I couldn't be in a better audience to ask this question. Does anyone, did anyone play Professor Bins in the film? No. So you never get any class, you never see Professor Bins or any, right. So, I mean, that means literally, I haven't, and is Professor Bins sort of like referred to in the later books? I mean, probably. But, even in the later ones? Maybe not. So, I could not have read that name, Professor Bins, for essentially, <laughs> genuinely over 15 years. So I'm feeling very proud of myself. That's just me showing off. Anyway, so to shout out to Professor Bins and his uh, History of Magic class, which I think was probably much maligned and actually secretly very good. How about you? What would your favorite class be? Um, I don't, maybe Charms. Charms, that's a good one too. That is good. That is that's like a less intense defense against the darts are dark arts, isn't it? I hate history so nice. I think that is a good that's a good call. Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. Hello. Hello, lovely to meet you again. Uh, somebody asked me to ask a question in Portuguese. I'm not going to do that because it's been 10 years since I've asked. Uh, you can't. Uh, oh. <laughs> you don't want to lose the it. The rule was to ask uh, questions in English. Okay. So okay. you've been, um, as a very young actor, you've been on a set with incredible actors such as Emma Thompson, Kenneth Branagh, the late and great Alan Rickman, Gary Oldman, Helen Bonham Carter, but also in How to Get Away with Murder with Viola Davis. Uh -huh. And I was wondering if you could or would like to share like maybe some personal advice that they gave you or some memorable moments with some of these legendary actors that you thought what was the other thing you said uh, uh, one of, uh, you said something personal or what? Uh, personal advice or maybe a fun anecdote or something that will stick with you as a person or as an actor for the rest of the yeah I, I um, it's funny the yeah, I suppose like in life, often we learn things from people without necessarily, not everything comes in the form of a lesson, right? So it's not always someone says, remember, this is really important and make sure you always do it. But maybe after a couple of years you go, that's funny, I do this or I behave in this way and I think that's important. And when did I start doing that? And you look back and you think, oh, that person used to do it and maybe watching them I sort of appreciated, maybe subconsciously. But that's an important way to go about something. Um, so I feel like that's something that happens a lot in life, but also, at least it's happened in my career, it's not, it's not always that someone has sat me down and been like, the thing you need to understand is. But you know, you learn working with people, and you learn talking to people, and you learn exchanging, as, as, as we do in life, from any interaction, you know, that, that's going to that's gonna change you a bit if you are open to the transformation. So, um, I count myself very fortunate to have worked with a whole number of lovely actors. So nothing um, specific that you said, oh, but this is something, as an actor or as a person, I owe that to, I don't know, Viola Davis or... I think, I think in this, as in life, conversations, art, I think of things as an exchange. 
I don't think we really ever owe anything to anyone, but that's not to say that it's all us either. Things happen, I think, in the meeting place between a piece of work and the audience, or a conversation, or, you know, in the exchange. Um, and I'll give you two sort of moments that have occurred to me now, so I can in some way answer your question. Um, I remember, and this actually will tie it all together quite nicely. Um, my dad is an actor, and was my, he, he really was my teacher. I didn't go to drama school, so I didn't have someone sitting there being like, good acting is this. I mean, you know, I read books and had conversations with people and all the rest of it, but I wasn't sort of, no one else really set themselves up as my instructor. I tell a lie, apart from a fantastic Spanish actor called Roberto Quintana, who um, is a wonderful classical actor, and he taught at the drama school in Seville, and he would teach Spanish Golden Age, a workshop on Spanish Golden Age literature, or Spanish Golden Age theater, and um, I would attend his classes. So he was genuinely a teacher and a, and a mentor. Um, but other than that, really, it was my dad. And I, when I was a kid, I would work on speeches with my dad to perform, or any job I had, or any audition I had, I'd go to him and I'd work on it with him. So he's the person I most learned from. And then one day on Harry Potter, um, Jim Broadbent came up to me as we were doing, you know, because I, I, I played Dean Thomas in the Harry Potter films. Essentially, I was there. I didn't really do too much, and I, you know, it was, it was, it was lovely, and I was very glad to be there. But it's, I didn't have scenes in the way I had in How to Get Away with Murder, sort of opposite these actors. Often, they're doing a classroom scene, and I'm in the classroom. They're all, we're all in the great hall together, as well as you know, 400 other people. But Jim Broadbent came up to me when we were doing whatever the classroom scene that, that um, we were filming and introduced himself and says, you're William Russell's son, aren't you? And I said, yes, yes I am. And it, whenever anyone knows my dad, I'm like, this is like the best thing that's ever happened to me. And he said, he taught me at Lambda, because my, my father, like me, didn't go to drama school, but taught at this drama school in London called Lambda. He directed, really, he, he, he sort of directed his play. And he said, he was my teacher, and I thought it was absolutely fantastic, and would you please, send in my regards and I was just, uh, I'm, I'm still just glowing from that, generally even just telling it now, I'm like, Jim Broadbent, Jim Broadbent, um, and he's an absolutely exceptional actor, um, and someone who I like for his work, but also like because I always remember that moment, so, um, so yeah, so that, that's something that really stood out for me, and another one was when I was shooting How to Get Away with Murder, um, we filmed the pilot in Philadelphia, which is where the show is set, but we shot the rest of the series in LA. Um, and when we were filming the pilot, I think it was the third day of shooting, we had a scene where, for anyone who's seen, who, who hasn't seen it, How to Get Away with Murder is an American network television show, which was on ABC, it is now on Netflix, and it stars Viola Davis, who's a, a terrific, exactly, a woo actor. Yeah. Um, she's absolutely brilliant. And um, when I did this job, I hadn't had a job like that with that much responsibility on screen. I'd done plays, but I, you know, it was it was a sort of job that kind of changed my career uh, in a lot of ways. And so on the third day of shooting, we had this group scene where there was this kind of cocktail party and everyone's standing around and all of us were there and da 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 da. And then that finished, and then there was a scene between my character and Viola Davis. And over the course of the series, there would be many, many scenes that were just my character and her character. But this was the first time we did it. Um, and I just I sort of said bye to everyone, and I was thinking about the scene, and I wasn't really, you know, taking stock of anything. I was just like, I'm just thinking about the scene. And then I, I, as I was sort of pacing around, thinking about the lines, I just looked to my left, and I just saw, you know, those sort of director's chairs that, that you, everyone imagines are on a film set. They really have them on film sets, and um, often they will have the actors' names on it. 
And I just walked along and I looked up and I just saw a chair that said Alfred Enoch and another one that said Viola Davis next to it. And I thought, huh, that's, that's cool. And then I sort of went back to thinking about the scene and we did the scene and, and that was really exciting because, yeah, because it was a sort of cracking scene and it, and it represented a different, I suppose, the start of a different phase of my career and I was really excited about it. So I always remember that fondly. That, yeah. I'm, I'm so grateful for all the people I've got to work with. You, you know, you've listed, you've named a lot of the more sort of famous people yeah, who are brilliant and have the recognition that their work deserves, but a lot of people don't have the recognition that their work deserves in my industry. A lot of actors are wonderful and could be um, given more opportunities to show their talent and their craft and their skill and don't get that and, and in many cases never get that. Um, so I just want to say I've learned a lot from those people as well. There are many people whose names you don't know who I've worked with who have given me direct pieces of advice or whatever, who have just been generous and warm with me, whose work has instructed me or formed my taste or my um, the way I sort of think about my work and think about my craft and they have been as important as the people you have mentioned and in some cases more and in some cases less but um, you know it takes a village doesn't it in just about anything so there we go. It's Thank just you. a short second question if I may. Yeah, very short. Um, I started watching How to Get Away with Her because of Viola Davis mm. and Shonda Rhimes and then I saw you and I said I recognize him, Dean Thomas, Harry Potter, okay. I was wondering, did you know what was going to happen in season three? I didn't know. I oh. found out. I was, uh, it's hard to have this conversation without spoilers, but um, yeah. something happens in season three. <laughs> something happens in season one, two, and yeah. four, five, and six. Um, but I didn't, the writer was like, oh, we've got this idea, but we don't know exactly how it's going to be. And then, um, as anything, eventually they sort of work out how it's going to be, and then you discover how it's going to be. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Hello. I have a que few questions to ask oh. you. Oh, sorry. Okay, we're going to hold it. Apologies. Okay. Sorry, hello. Hello, um, so I'm a really big fan of the Harry Potter franchise, and my question is, what is your favorite memory with the cast? My fa yeah, difficult to have a favorite memory, also because my memories are not very clear because I have a bad memory. Um, I, it's, it's not a specific instance, it's just I remember that time fondly because we were sort of, people were very patient and generous with us and it was an exciting thing to be part of and it was the sort of the beginning of my career. Um, and you know, you spend a lot of time with people and you get to know them and you become close and that's a bond and sometimes you don't see those people maybe for a long time but when you, so recently I saw Devon for the first time, Claire Sheamus for the first time in a long time. And I just was kind of catching up with him and learning about his life and what he's been up to. And that's lovely because, you you know, it's a big bond to do something with someone for 10 years. Anytime, you know, I did, a, I, I, I did two films earlier in the year and on both of them, actually, I met Stumpen, who had been on Harry Potter, who I'd sort of known quite well. So I was like, oh my God, Pete, what are you doing? How's it going? You know, big catch up with the same thing. I was like, Nick, Nick John. Yeah, you know, it was brilliant. So, um, so I guess that's my the thing that I remember most fondly is the people and the connections that you made with people. That's kind of the thing that was most precious to me. Thank you. Oh, do we? we hello. I have a question. Yes. Two, two questions for you. The first, uh, in the real life, not as uh, Dean Thomas, but uh, as uh, Alfred Enoch, uh -huh. in which arm of Hogwarts? Will you see well? And uh, the second question: Do you think that Professor McGonagall will make will make a good teacher of defense against dark arts? Okay. So I think I I I mean I've done the test, but or the sorting hat quiz. But before I ever did that, I think I knew I'm a Gryffindor. Um, which I was more happy about. I mean, I see you're a Gryffindor as well, so solidarity, but I used to be more happy about that when I was younger. Now I'm like, it's a bit passe, isn't it, to be a Gryffindor, it's a bit of, it's not the edgiest choice. It's not even really a choice, so I'm, I'm, I'm But anyway, I, I, I'm a Gryffindor. 
And do I think Professor McGonagall would be a good defense against the dark arts teacher? I think so. Yeah. Why not? Okay. I think so. Thank you. Thank you. Give Have a job. nice day. Thank you very much. Thanks for the question. Hello. Hello. Um, it might be a bit of a random question, but what is your guilty pleasure? What's my guilty pleasure? Mm. But the first thing I thought of when you said that was like really fancy food. I, to be honest, food is my, there's nothing guilty about liking food. To be honest, because we need it, so that's that's a good start. Um, I love food, but I love all food. I really love all kinds of food. Anything from like a McDonald's to you know it's fine dining. Um, so it's not really a guilty pleasure, is it? Now sometimes uh, you feel a bit guilty when you, well, I say that, if you go to a very fancy restaurant and the bill comes, then maybe you feel a bit guilty. <laughs> but, I, you know, I say that and I almost want to take it back straight away because, you know, the craftsmanship that has gone into making that, for, you know, running a very, very fancy restaurant, pretty much running any restaurant, is not necessarily a very easy, profitable business. That is a lot of work, a lot of hours, a lot of training, you know, if you if you go into one of these sort of you know a Michelin star restaurant, the work that the chefs have put in to, to perfect their craft, the amount of them are required to make the, to do the processes to make any one dish, the amount of dishes they say, you know, everything. You, you're like, so to say it's a guilty pleasure almost makes it sound like they're taking the piss and just charging you that because they're they're just having a laugh. But it's expensive, I think, because. That's a lot of craftsmanship, and that's a lot of artistry that has gone into making your food. Um, but yes, anyway, I'll give that as my answer. Thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Hello. Hi, Alfred. Hello. Uh, if you would have to choose an object to turn into a Horcrux, what would it be? Oh, that's a good question. Um, object to turn into a Horcrux? I don't know. Probably something like unexpected, something a bit, something a bit ordinary. Do you know what I mean? Something a bit ordinary that could, um... But indestructible like though. But what? Indestructible. That you can't, um, yeah. Yes, but does it have to be indestructible? Or does it, like, I mean, nothing's indestructible, right? But it becomes, I mean, yes. Um, God, I don't know. No idea. I'm, I'm just thinking like a rock or something. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? That was not my first thought. I don't know. What would you choose? Like uh, the old school Nokia 3310. <laughs> <laughs> that is a, that's such a good answer. I'm not going to say anything else. That's the best. And Nokia 3310. Brilliant. There we go. That's yes. I think we can all testify. And you can play Snake on it. So sure. that would be good. Fits I'd well. actually go for a 3210 because I preferred Snake 1. To Snake 2, and with Snake 2, I would always. I mean, I'm sure everyone under the age of like 30 doesn't have a clue what we're talking about, unless it's become retro and cool enough that people now have 32 tens, ironically, as a kind of fashion statement. I don't think we're quite doing it. There's a new 32 10. There's a what? Yeah, there's a new one. There's a new 32, really? It has, it has a new yeah. snake. Amazing. The moment it's arrived, it's incredible. <laughs> I've sort of always been shocked by like. Retro seems to be getting closer and closer. I remember <laughs> when I like, feels like retro was like 70s when I was like at school, and then like two years later I was at university, it was like 80s, and then like it was not, it, it was noughties by the time we were barely out of the noughties. I was like, what's going on? Retro is going to be the future soon. It's going to be very confusing. Um, yes, the, I only made the adjustment of Snake 3210 because I prefer Snake 1 to Snake 2, but that's a fantastic choice. That's, there it is. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. <laughs> Hello. Uh, yes, great right question. My question is when you were working on the Harry Potters, mm. did any of the cast members play any good pranks on each other? Play good pranks? Yes, people were playing pranks all the time. Um, I cannot remember them, which is, a, I'm sorry, it's a bit of a dull answer, but, um, but that's two things. One, that's my bad memory, which I mentioned, but the other thing is, that's because there was quite a lot of messing around. Um, so there were quite a lot of examples. 
I think there was one that I'm almost not sure if I remember it happening or if I remember it being talked about, but someone had a fart machine in the great wall. The people thought this is like out there. I remember being reminded of this and I was like, oh yeah, but now I'm like not sure if I've just heard the story so many times. I think I remember it, but I don't remember it. But um but so there was lots of that sort of kind of there was lots of funny, gentle misbehaviour, which was good, but it made it a good time. Thank, Thank you. you. Hello. Hello, very nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, my question is, I've seen yesterday that your favorite Harry Potter character was Snake, mm. right? Yes. Who is your favorite How to Get Away with Murder character? God, I think I, I had to consider this um, yesterday. I think it's got to be Annalise Keating. She's the most, she's the most interesting character, isn't it? I mean, I mean the, the show revolves around her, right? And, and you get to see so much of her and so much of her backstory and I think I said yesterday we get or well, it seems to me that people get very fixated on characters being likable and I've never really I mean it's I'd rather a character that was interesting than likable I suppose to some degree likable is implied in that but I feel like often the characters that are more interesting than the characters that you know to refer to a Shakespeare play, Richard III is an interesting character, not likable. <laughs> you know I mean, you wouldn't want to really go anywhere near him. Or Iago, or these characters can be compelling. And so I think one of the functions of storytelling is to put us into other people's shoes and um, shine a light on other people's experiences. And I think when storytelling enables you to make connections with characters that you might otherwise go they did that they're bad they're wrong they're evil and just to us to other them when you sort of when you get to know them through storytelling we can develop an empathy for that which i think is one of the kind of most powerful things of storytelling so i think it's a bit of a problem if if we decide only to tell stories about likeable characters. Because also, if everyone's likeable and nice to each other, there's not much of a story. It's the, nothing happens. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think Annalise is... But to be honest, that's one of the, I think, fun things about how to get away with murder. None of the characters are just nice and likeable. Even the ones who are nice and likeable do things that you wouldn't expect or whatever. So, um, but, you know, Annalise is a compelling character, isn't she? And there's so much there and I mean it's you know it's slightly I mean it's outrageous the amount of things that's happened to that woman in her life and as the sort of backstory kept getting bigger I was like how does any one person survive all of this and it, I suppose on the other hand you're like no wonder it keeps getting worse <laughs> because it, you know how do you, how do you start the cleanup operation but um a fire is brilliant and, and, and played it brilliantly and got so much out of it and, um, I brought a real groundedness, I think, and a real kind of psychological truthfulness to a character that otherwise would have just been cartoonish because of the amount of backstory, because of the amount of stuff. So, you know, I'm going to say Annalise Keaton. But that is no slight on the other characters. I think everyone else, I, uh, you know, everyone always, and rightly, because Viola is extraordinary and, and, and the show is so about Annalise, and Annalise is the show's central focus, as, as I say, rightly. But there's so much good work that I think everyone did on that show, the cast, do such a great job to, kind of like what I was saying about Viola, to bring a kind of humanity and some kind of psychological veracity to quite outrageous happenings. So I sort of really respect all the work that everyone did and the characters that were created. But I'll say Annalise. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello. Oh, you're going to get a mic adjust, that's good. Um, can I ask, what was your favorite spell, or the spell you think was the funniest? My favorite spell? I think my favorite spell, I think two. Either Lumos, which is light, yeah. or Alahamora, because it's good to be able to get behind a locked door every now and then. Yeah, now. that's true. Um, what's yours? Um, I think mine is uh, Avada Kedavra. Oh, gosh. <laughs> There we go. Yes, okay, good. Not necessarily what else I was expecting it you to say. It sounds good in the mouth. You know, the sound is very good. It's what? It sounds good. Yes. It does sound like, good. I'll give you, you that. You go like, Avada Kedavra. Okay, I was, 
a little bit concerned then, but that was. I mean, and with the conviction that you brought to that, I was, as I say, even more concerned. But thank you. I think I'm going to answer another question before I go up in a puff of smoke. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Uh, love the t-shirt, by the way. Um, I love my, oh, love my t-shirt. Sorry, I didn't hear you. Thank you. Um, I have a question about the food at Hogwarts. Because you... Could you... Yeah, sorry, my hearing is very bad. No, <laughs> no problem. I have a question about the food at Hogwarts, ah. because you always see this fancy feast, but was it actually tasty? Was it actually tasty? That's a good question. I'm going to say no, because the food in films is never as good as it looks. This is one of the things, it has to look good, because ultimately the people watching don't get to eat it, but they get to see it. So, um, so it looked amazing. But I think it was probably just edible. Probably so much, so, so much focus is going on making it look good that it's less about making it taste good. Um, but often you wouldn't really get to eat, you know, those big turkeys I think were on the table were often were just fake. They were like made of, I don't know, plastic or something. Um, so that definitely wasn't tasty. But there was some stuff that we could eat. And I'm very indiscriminate. As I say, I love all food. So, I, you know, if someone puts a bit of food down in front of me, I'm happy. There's a thing that happens, if you ever have to eat as an actor on screen, the tip, and you'll, you'll, now I say this, if you don't know this already, you will see this all the time, that all actors are basically like, obviously don't eat. Obviously like, pick the food up, look like you're going to take a bite or don't, or take a tiny bite, because you have to do it take after take after take after take. I don't go by that at all. So I was doing, I was doing a job recently and I was, I was eating and I was really eating and someone was like, are you sure you're going to be alright? You know, we've got to... I was like, don't worry, um, I'm a bottomless pit, so that's not a problem. On How to Get Away with Murder, I was, there was a scene where we ate pizza and the prop master said to me, look, Normally I work with actors and I barely bother asking what they want to eat because I know they're not going to eat anything. They'll just push it around the plate and, you know. But he was like, but as I know you, what pizzas do you want? And I'm going to make sure we have enough for you. We had 17 pizzas or something. I had that order and I was like, I think I think pepperoni would be good or whatever I went for. And I was just going and going and it was great. So that's one of the perks of the job for me. But I have a very different methodology to most actors on that. Um, but look out for it, you'll probably, you'll probably notice that actors in scenes will either take like tiny, tiny mouthfuls or like they'll have plates and they'll like do stuff with the food but essentially try to avoid eating the food. Um, yeah, lack of commitment, that's what I think that is. Thank you, have a nice day. Thank you. Hello. Hi. When you started playing Wes in How to Get Away with Murder, what was your dream scenario of how the character will end, um, as in relationships, dead or alive? I don't think I had an idea of where I wanted it to go when it started. Um, I was just, you know, I, I, I had something interesting happen. I, I, I had never worked on television. At that point, that's a lie, I had. But I hadn't done very much television. Um, so I wasn't, in fact, I'd never played a part that had been in more than one episode of television. Obviously, Harry Potter was different because I was in have like, seven of the eight films. Um, but on TV, that wasn't something I really knew. So when I got, when we started filming the second episode, of How to Get Away with Murder, which was, we shot the pilot in the sort of springtime, end of the winter, um, and then we went back and shot the whole series of the first series. Um, and when we got the script for the second episode, I was shocked, because I was like, oh, this is what happens next. Because I play, I, I've been doing plays, and you know, you do the play, you read the script, you do the performance, and then that's the end. So you don't like get to sort of really find out what happens next with the character. And that was sort of so novel to me at that point. Um, so I guess in a way I didn't really have those expectations. So I, I didn't really think about the work in, in, in that way. Um, but by the end, ah, oh, I wanted a happy ending 
for, I mean, again, you can't really talk about this without giving a spoiler, so I'm just going to say, I wanted a happy ending for my character Wes. Which, yeah, right, which is, which I think anyone who has seen it will know what I mean by that, and anyone who doesn't can watch it if they want to or not, if they don't. Yeah. Uh, we're excited of your comeback in uh, season six. Oh, spoiler. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, it was nice because I got to go back and see everyone. You know, it was, you know, I spent a long time working there with a lot of different people who got very close. I was got very close to, and it was just a nice reason to go back and see everyone again. So I was like, and also there was something really nice about being there at the end. I mean, the very first scene we shot at we were, I was in the very first scene we shot. And I think, I can't remember if they ended up making the scene that is the last scene of the series, the last thing we shot. Maybe not, but I think I shot on the, like, the last day. There was something nice about being there for the very end. That's always a kind of nice closure. So that was lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Enoch, you have to leave in 10 minutes. Okay. So, no, no, everyone can ask me a question, but please, one question and make it easy. He and has, to, he has to catch his train. So. I'll be more concise. Hello. If magic exists, yes. what would I like to do? Yes. Um, I would... I'm stuck between two things. Either be able to control time, which would just be very useful because I'm very disorganized and often late. So that would be good. Or also I'd like history, so I'd like to be able to go back in time and see what things were like in the past. And, I'd like to be able to wake up in the morning and press pause and sleep for another two hours. That'd be good too sometimes. Um, so either controlling time or just being able to fly somehow. I think being able to fly would just be really fun. That would be fun. Whether it was on a broomstick or just like yourself, you could just fly around. That that'd be kind of. But that would probably make me even more late. So I'd probably need both of those because I'd probably be flying around places and remember I had to, you know, I don't know, go to the bank. So, um, yeah, those are my two answers. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hi there. Uh, how are you? I'm very well, thanks. How are you? Hello. I'm very good. Um, Extra question, very clever. <laughs> <laughs> um, I recently ran to the, um, the concert of Harry Potter, uh -huh. and uh, Chris was there, and he was speaking. And Chris Rankin? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, he was lovely. Um, and he said that apparently at the first movie there was a scene where a girl comes in and tells you the troll is there, the troll is here. Um, and apparently nobody told that that would happen. And I would like you to confirm or... No, uh, apparently nobody acted there because nobody was told that the scene would happen at that moment. Ah, I am the worst person to ask because I cannot remember if that was maybe 14 years ago. So you're saying in the first film, yeah, someone was, uh, comes Carl? in, Chris's character comes... Oh, who? Uh, no, uh, the, the one with full words, the back of his head. Quirrell. The one with what, sorry? Voldemort on the back of his head. Oh, Quirrell, Professor Quirrell, yeah. right, right, yes, yes. The one with Voldemort on yeah. the back of his head, yes. That's a very good description. Um, uh, came in and said, the troll, there's a troll. And no one reacted because no one knew we were uh, rolling. I think the directors wanted uh, an honest reaction from everyone. Okay. Uh, because um, Hubert had a very, very convincing uh, reaction. A reaction. Um, so. So did he believe there was a real troll? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I, I, Whatever I, works. I, I recently know. watched the film again and it's really. Uh, a thing for everyone here to do. Okay. His face is, is hilarious. Oh, right, right. Oh, there we go. Well, look, I have no reason to doubt what Chris <laughs> says. Okay. So I'll say that, even though I can't remember, so I can't really affirm or oh, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Sorry, I couldn't be more insightful on that. Hello. Hello. 
I can imagine this is a very busy weekend for you. You're away from home. You have a lot of impulses and vibes here the whole weekend. So my question for you is, how are you today? <laughs> it's such a sweet question. Bless you. That's, it's also, I almost want to say, in the nicest way, that's a preposterous question. I'm having a lovely time. It's, <laughs> I mean, I've had a very, very nice weekend. Um, so I'm very well. That's just very generous. And I, I suppose maybe that helps me answer the question because I think one of the reasons I've had a nice weekend is because everyone's been so thoughtful and just generous and warm and, you know, people come and, and I suppose share their passion for something. Often in my case it's Harry Potter or it might be How to Get Away with Murder or whatever it is. And, you know, you get a sense of how much these stories have affected people and how much they love them. Um, and people thank you for being part of that. And, you know, no one has to thank me. <laughs> I'm, I'm an actor and I get to tell stories for a living and that's what I've always wanted to do. I'm not doing a favor to anyone. But that's also something very lovely because that thank you is not you know, it's like, I suppose, applause at the end of a piece of theatre or something. It's, it's, a, it's a way of recognising work that was put in and, and, and sharing your enjoyment. In a way, that's a continuation of the exchange, isn't it? It's saying, this gave something to me and you put something into it and I put my time and energy into it and invested in it and I suspended my disbelief and I, you know, and, and it's just another recognition of a connection that's happened and an exchange that's happened. Um, so I always find that really lovely, and I think one of the things I'm, I'm, I most like about coming to convention is, is getting a sense of the sort of the community that builds up around storytelling. I think, you know, I tell stories for a living. That's what I love doing, and I get to, and I and I get to. I'm very fortunate to be able to. Um, but it's not just that it's a fun and nice thing to do, and this is one of the nice things to do about it. You know, I get to come to a beautiful city and meet nice people who are very nice to me, and people seem to be having a nice time, and it's a nice energy to be around. Um, but also, I think storytelling is important. I think stories are important. Um, not just fiction, you know, the stories that we tell about who we are and how we understand the world or how we understand each other, all of this is storytelling, you know, histories, stories. Um, so I'm very glad to be here because this is a recognition, I think, of the power of story, storytelling and that's something I believe in very passionately. So, yes, I'm very well. Thank you. Thank you. How are you? So Thank you. I'm fine, thank you. Good. So I can only wish for you to take all this energy home with you. Thank you. And That's a beautiful it. wish. And a wish I would extend to everyone in this room and everyone who's come. I hope it's been fulfilling and happy. And I hope you can take that on home and into your wings. And yeah, thank you all. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very okay, much. Okay, final question. Hello. Hello. Um, my question for you is, uh, do you have any dream projects in acting? Do I have any dream projects? Yes. Um, kind of like someone asked the question about what I wanted my character's sort of uh, end to be or how I worked on how to get away with murder, where I wanted it to go. And in a way, I didn't really think about that. Uh, in the same way, uh, I want to get to do things which I find interesting which I can connect to, which other people can connect to, which can entertain people, and which I can find challenging and, 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 and stimulating. Um, that could be almost anything. Like, that's not like a specific, I want to do this one thing or that one thing. Because one of the lovely things about acting is the variety. You get to play different parts. Um, you can work on screen or on stage or on radio or whatever. Um, and tell different kinds of stories. It could be a romantic comedy, it could be a fantasy epic, it could be, you know, it could be anything. Um, that said, um, I think the first, the first play I remember seeing was Henry V, which is a Shakespeare play. 
um, which I think is an extraordinary play. Um, it's almost like two plays. Sometimes it's a story about the wonderful British, the wonderful English beating the French, ooh, and you know, sometimes it's a very kind of simplistic, nationalistic tale, or sometimes it's made like that. And it has a bit of the kind of excitement of nationalism, but I think one of the reasons the play is so good is it has another side, which talks about the horrors of war, and it makes a very direct link between that enthusiasm and that um, kind of sense of patriotism and how that's so easily weaponized into destruction and meaningless slaughter. And so I find it as a piece of writing an extraordinary play. So I'd love to get to do Henry V one day. But I mean, there are lots of things I'd love to do, you know? I'm, 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 um, but you know, I suppose I thought of that now because I've just seen a really good film called All Quiet on the Western Front, which I think is gonna be on Netflix which is an adaptation of a German novel which has been twice made into films in English but has never been done in German. And I think the title, and I speak no German, so let me see if I can remember, I don't know if anyone speaks German here, but is, I think, Im Westen nicht Neues. So there's, no, there's no, nothing new on the Western Front. There's no, uh, and it's a horrific novel about the kind of horrors of the First World War and it's been made into an amazing adaptation, a brilliant film which is on Netflix, and you know, if you can summon the energy, watch it, because it's horrifying, but also there's a beauty in it, in the way it recognizes humanity's capacity for tenderness, even in a, even in a context as horrendous as that. I suppose that slightly made me think of Henry V, but um, you know, I just want to tell stories, you know, so it's a lovely thing to do with your time. So that's the main thing. Thank you. Thank you. Hey guys, put your hands together for Albert Enoch. Thank you all very, very much. I just want to say thank you again. And, and yes, I hope you all have a lovely week and a lovely month and a lovely year and onwards. Always um, welcome back in Belgium. I, I would be delighted to. But thank you all for your generosity and your kindness. Go <laughs> well. Three!